His name is Brain. Actually, Brian, but then apparently they messed up his birth certificate. So it was spelt Brain, and he just kind of ran with it. And he's now a doctor, so it couldn't have been that bad. Uh, and uh, Suparana Apte. And they're talking about Python in the real world, healthcare in Africa. Um, so <laughs> Brain has a PhD from the University of Witzvater's Runt. And um, Suparana has no PhD and um, has only ever had uh, reviews for restaurants published. Um, but they both sound very interesting. And we look forward to, you, uh, to your speech. Thank you. Hello? Yeah. Oh. They kicked me out of the <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna I'm just gonna scream. Um, hi, my name okay. As he said, my name is Brain. Yes, Brain. And <laughs> she's she, she then this is my 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 uh, colleague Supana. Uh, we we developed software for a company called ThoughtWorks from our offices in Grand Fontaine in Johannesburg. And today we're going to present to you guys how we used uh, a, a little Python app. Uh, to combat a really big problem in Africa and the world. And I know it's okay. Have you ever been sick? Who has? Nobody? Very oh, people. we have, yeah, so healthy bunch of people. Is it Cape Town weather? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what do you normally do when you get sick? You got sick, you took your medicine, you took your rest, and it was fine, right? Everything was fine. You were back to normal, rocking. But imagine that if you the medicine you took was fake you wouldn't get better better you would make more people around you sick but did you know that one in three medicines that are sold in Africa is fake and they are in fact chemicals that can be life-threatening hmm shocking so when we say fake medicals they are not just sugar pills right so um, there are some chemical tests that can be done to confirm the authenticity but they are not completely reliable because these fake medicine produce producers are smart they put just enough chemicals to pass the test but not enough to fight the disease and they are made to look exactly the same can you tell the difference which one is fake which one is not on the top anybody no they look exactly the same. They are often packaged and labeled similar to the real ones. But they are manufactured on the side that looks something like this. Yeah, See how unhygienic this is? The chemicals are mixed up without any medical knowledge whatsoever. And they may have harmful concentration of the drugs. So there are, they cause like around 100,000 deaths every year in Africa. The situation is dire. Enter Bright and M pedigree from Ghana. They wondered how we can solve this problem using technology. And that's when we engage ThoughtWorks. Um, this is how we, uh, we approach the problem. So first, who were our key stakeholders? Innocent people in remote areas, some of them who don't have <laughs> so innocent people in remote areas, some of them who don't even who can't even tell the difference between the fake. I mean, we we tried to to, to, to tell the difference and we couldn't. Um, pharmaceutical companies who don't want their brands and names associated or tarnished by this fake medication. Who else? In the, who else is affected? Retailers, distributors, who don't want to be part of this chain, but are, are generally are even unaware that they are part of this chain killing people in the community. So our approach was we wanted to ensure that the control is in the hands of the general public. Let the people on the ground level be able to, to, to have a difference between what they're taking and what's been given. So who knows what this is? Yeah. So when you buy a prepaid mobile, you scratch the silvery part and then you message that code and you see you get the airtime, right? 
So with on the similar lines, pharmaceutical companies would label their products with a hidden code. When you buy the medicine, you scratch off the silvery part, see the hidden code, and then enter that hidden code into our system, and we respond saying whether it's a fake product or it's it's a authentic one. So how do we enable people all over Africa enter these numbers into our system? Because the most affected people don't have internet access or even the habit of using internet for anything and everything like us. So the answer was mobile. So everybody has got a mobile. Even from rural areas to the cities, everybody can send and receive an SMS. So when you buy a medicine, you scratch the silvery part, enter the send an SMS entering that code, and you get a response saying it's a fake or it's an authentic product. So we've got an idea, and we've got we've thought about what what uh, what we want to use. Uh, uh, we want people to use as an interface to our system. How do we go about it? The first decision was to choose a technology that would help us in, uh, down that path. We had to build a showcase and, uh, as the first, uh, for our first app and do that in a very rapid, in a, in a very short space of time. And to add to that the fact that we needed to interact with the client, get different uh, new fun functionality and rapidly integrate that and get b b feedback back from, that, from the client. So that, that required us to, uh, to do some sort of continuous integration and and we need a language that, uh, that can give us the rapid prototyping capability the other thing which we we, we we did was because we were deploying we were interacting and pushing and giving it to the client to see and then we get feedback and all we needed something that could handle some deployment scripts python came in and solved <laughs> <laughs> what is a python that's a python <laughs> python came in and and we thought it was the best fit for what we wanted to achieve Add to that the fact that when we did a we did a bit of a survey around Africa, we saw that there was m a lot of Python uh, programmers available who could maintain the systems. So there was a we, we saw it as a long-term maintainable and uh, possible development that can be done on this. So we've got our technology. What's the next task? We decided we're gonna send and receive. We're gonna send an SMS. Send and receive an SMS. Simple as that. Vumi came in and rescued the day. And not just because we, lo we love them. Uh, it's West, West, uh, they, they, yes. That's one of the developers. We chose Vumi for this because Vumi is already an integration frame framework that has, has uh, messaging capabilities and is integrated already with a couple of protocols, your Telnet, Telcos, uh, Gchat. And it's, it's open source, but it's very actively supported. We had a, a lot of interaction with them during, during the, the startup phase. And we, 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 so we set up Vumi for our requirements and tested and, and made sure that Vumi was running how it should, it should be, it should run. Number one, it's built for scalability. And with this application, because we were targeting a whole lot of people, scalability was going to be an issue. Number two is built around, around cloud environment and, and deployment. That answered our requirement. And number three, there's already integration in multiple territories with multiple net, uh, the telcos. And that's what we were targeting. So that met those three uh, requirements. So it provided us a framework with which we could, we could seamlessly integrate with different telcos. That's a typical, simple setup. So you've got two main things that are required, the transport and application, uh, and application workers. Your transport receives, and receives inbound and outbound messages, and the application uh, workers processes them and responds if it has to or does something else within the system. So we, we started by writing a simple log file that we receive an SMS, we log it somewhere and then we, 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 we reverse the text and then we send it back, we, we, we send it as a response. So your typical data you'd receive would be like the sample data where the content is what is the actual data that came in. And we did a reverse application uh, which just it takes that message, that MSG, and then it reverses it. So let's let's look at some real code, if you guys don't mind. <laughs> and this is thanks to the to, to some of the code we got from Vumi. So there you've got 
setting up the workers. So we've got a telnet client and we've got the re reverse application, uh, which I'm going to show. So the telnet, we're just saying, uh, tel uh, use a telnet on port 9003 and my application. So you've got, it, it extends your simple application worker, which is, you can find it on the Vumi demo. It takes your, 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 your content, reverses it, and then just returns it. And I'll do a telnet. That's really nice. Okay. Okay. So that's my, my app running. So I can put whatever I want. And all of this took us a f few minutes to set up and, and run, integrating with the telnet. So we've ha we have now our demo, our demo uh, system that can receive an SMS, log it, reverse text, test, and we want to we wanna now do it in an environment. Okay. So how do we choose our production environment? So if you think about our system, that we are building, we need it to be up all the time. Imagine you have a sick friend late at night. You run to the pharmacy, you buy the medicine, and before you give it to your friend, you want to verify that this is authentic. You send us an SMS, you really don't want to hear, sorry, we are closed. So that was our main requirement. The first hosting decision that we took was not to try to host in house. So on to the cloud. So we decided to host on a virtual private server because we wanted to have better control over the system. So we investigated African and global cloud providers. So the African cloud providers seemed pretty expensive for us. So our choice came down to Amazon, AWS, and then Linode. So uh, for our specific requirements, like we needed it to be up all the time, and we needed it to be cheap. So the Linode turned out to be the best value option. We set it up and we were ready to go. We could send and receive an SMS and all like people all over Africa could use our system. But now when you have people all over Africa using your application, what happens? You get lots and lots and lots and lots of codes. They are going to be in billions. That's a lot of data. Specifically, fast index-based lookups and high volume of writes. As you would probably know, that traditional relational database would cringe. Does anybody know like what else we could use? So this pointed <laughs> to a non-relational database. So which relational non-relational database do we use? So with Django non-rail, MongoDB has good support with Django. So we went with that. Our next goal was to find trends. Like what, what part of Africa is the most affected? Nigeria, Ghana, how, how we could determine that? Or which products are the most fake? That one, that one, that one. We don't know, but we have a lot of data. So if we could use that data to find these trends, then it would be great. We could take some external measures like notify that area or notify the pharmaceutical company so that they can do something about it. So MapReduce queries to the rescue. So it has a map function, a reduce function, and then the output. Assume that the document in a collection looks something like this. Very simple, basic, it has a product name, code, and invalid or not. So the way MapReduce query works is that map function is called for each document in the collection. It emits a key and a dictionary. So in this particular example, the document will respond, like, sorry, the map uh, function will respond with a product name, which is some like a key, and then a dic dictionary, which says, OK, this invalid inquiries were there for this product. And you, the next step is the reduce function. So the reduce function aggregates what map function sends to it. 
So it takes that product name and the invalid inquiries with like array of invalid inquiries for all these documents. Then it pretty aggregates it and says uh, that okay, for this product name, these like these many invalid inquiries were there. The crucial part here that we realize only after like facing the problem that we wrote all this. Okay, it just takes uh, function, math function, reduce function. We wrote those. It does that. We deploy it, and then we realize that oh, it is running twice. This why does anybody know? Okay, so what happens is if you have multiple map functions, if, if you want to have massive parallelization, you can have, say, one server running uh, map function on 10 documents, then another for 10, another for 10, and then they all reduce that, like, th those 10 documents to, say, 1, 1, 1. Then these, are, these three are run again together to reduce them to 1. So it is very crucial that this reduce function returns the key and uh, dictionary that looks exactly the same as map function so that it can fed into the next stage of the reduce function. So now we could have uh, at this point we could query the code and we could find some trends. So everything was happy and rocking in the non-relational world. But how do you know if the code that somebody has sent is valid? Whether a pharmaceutical company actually uh, uh, did that code, generated that code, and, uh, and appended it to the, uh, to, the to the box. This code for some sort of web admin interface. So you know the usual things on, the, on, on your typical application, your users, your roles, your uh, approvals. We needed those as well. And we thought the Django user auth applic application answered that for us as a perfect fit. However, Django comes, comes with, a, with, 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 a, with a relational database management system. And we had already gone down the MongoDB path because of the, multi, like she said, the non-relational database problem with the multiple codes. So we had to find a way of hacking uh, MongoDB to work with uh, the Django of app, which had some sort of relations in, in build. And after trying for a couple of for, for a little while, it became uh, pretty dirty, and we thought we're gonna check it out, and we're just gonna we use a, a relational database environment, and this called us to leave the polyglot persistence lifestyle. Keyword, but you must look. <laughs> so we had the application running with MongoDB and MySQL. Um, the codes which were coming in, Mongo would handle, and the rest of the relational stuff, MySQL would hang handle. But then, how do we manage that now? What models would sit with, with Mongo? What models would sit on MySQL? Luckily enough, there was, there's a Django, Django's got what's called the router, the database router, and we're able to use that to, to, to for, it to, for us to tell what model should go to Mongo and what model should be handled by MySQL. But with that, with the, my, with, but with the, no, the relational came migration. So we, we didn't know ahead what, what the, the DBs would look like. We didn't know ahead what data would, would be in those DBs. So we needed some scheme that would be able to uh, do migrations for us, schema migration. What schema migration? So let's say you've got a user. And initially, you want to just capture the username. And eventually, the system requirements change, and you need to capture the, 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 the email address as well. Do you go back and rewrite your system just to add that field, or do you just find a way to seamlessly make sure that from there onwards, all the, all the, the, develop, the development environments or any environment which is going to run in onto can just have that column added? That was the schema migration which we needed to do, and we, we, need, we identified that we're going to need to do that. Same thing with the first, say, the data migration. You've got a first name field, and all of a sudden the user decides, I don't want, you've got a name field, and all of a sudden the user decides, I don't want it to be named no more. I want a first name and a last name. You already have data in, in, your, in your database, that host name. How do you manage uh, the current data and make sure that you can move that data to the new DB which you want to do? That required us to do some data migration work. After investigating a whole lot of apps, or a lot of uh, tools out there, we eventually uh, took South as the way forward because it gave us a whole lot of benefits. 
But note, you should write your South migration scripts so that they can also be able to run on an empty database. Because the assumption a lot of people make is, okay, I'm going to write this migration script. This data is going to move my data and convert them to what I need, I need it to do. But what, what happens in the case where you, you want to test your system and it's an empty database? Has anyone ever thought of it? How did you do it? Anyone? So it's important that do not just write your migration script with the assumption that you've got data always. Because it might just break when you move it to a new environment where it, which, has, which has no data. So have, have that in the back of your mind. The other thing which we noted with South was the auto-generated migration scripts were creating scripts with, in, with incremental numbers. And that led to an issue where if two, two pairs are working on, on, on a migration script and no one has called that, hey, I'm going to be doing a migration script and pushing it across. We then generate migration scripts with the same number and they, when, when it's trying to migrate, it's confused which of them is the right migration. So we came up with a, with a, with a, with a Kleenex box as our migration token. Whoever had the Kleenex box had the right to do the, the migration. Not very healthy, but no one got sick. Uh, whoever had that box did the migration and until they handed the box over, no one was allowed to write another migration script. Uh, someone pinched our migration box, so we came out with a migration ball. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, does, has anybody used non-relational databases here? Yeah? So, yeah, so you faced, so uh, for non-relational database, you don't really have the problems of schema migration that much because it doesn't have schema. But it does have some problems because, as he said, if you want to have like name and then you want to split uh, split that and have first name and last name, then all all your previous documents which co which uh, which are in that collection are going to have name, and they don't have first name and last name. So there are multiple strategies. One is you just run it in the background and say before the deployment and keep the name and also duplicate first name and last name for all your previous documents or then, the, the, like, whenever you load the document, like, say, you start doing storing first name and last name for new documents, all your old documents still has name, but whenever they are loaded for the first time, you change it with first name and last name, and you save it back. So, yeah, it doesn't really need these kind of migrations, but it had some other strategies to deal with that problem. So, okay, so let's recap what we have so far. An SMS comes in. Vumi sends it to the application. The application does some processing, track, tracking, analysis, and then it sees if the code is valid or not. It sends it back to Vumi, and Vumi sends it back to the um, user using SMS. So this uh, like application started taking a long time to respond to Vumi. We quickly realized that to send a yes or no response for the co code validation, we don't really need to do that analysis and tracking part. That is something different. So that can be separated. In this case, like, has an, does anybody have any ideas how can we handle this? Anybody? This is a pretty common problem. Everybody must have seen this. Nobody wants to talk? <laughs> <laughs> you do it in the background, <laughs> right. So we use salary for this. So now, what Vumi does is it creates this uh, salary task. It says, OK, salary, you go and do this. And it then it calls the application. And then application, the only thing application does is checks the validity of the code and sends it back, which is blazing fast. So let's talk about salary a bit. So salary is a distributed asynchronous task mm. queue, not only for Django. So what that means is whenever you create a salary task, the worker, one of the workers, parallel workers, are going to pick it up. And then they are going to do that task. And the distribution of tasks to the workers is handled by a message queue. So there are multiple options for message queue. Anybody use anything? Redis, RabbitMQ, <laughs> yeah? Another option is just using MongoDB. So when we, we were comparing those, the main problem we had was number of parallel tasks. So as we have seen before, we are going to have lots and lots of code coming in, and we are going to run this task, like one task 
for code coming in. S uh, so when, when you have Redis doing it, it performs fast when you have small number of parallel tasks. But as it starts growing, rescue performance starts, uh, sorry, Redis performance starts going down. So we decided to go with RabbitMQ, whose performance is good for high number of parallel tasks. So Celery makes asynchronous parallel processing pretty straightforward. So you instan instantiate it with a broker using AMQP. So AMQP is a protocol that is, that is used by RabbitMQ. It's an open standard for all messaging middleware. Then you create a Celery task. Pretty straightforward. You just define a method and you label it as a Celery task. So all this, this method will do the actual ingesting, like tracking, analysis stuff. And then you start the workers. Now you need to change your Wumi code to send, like actually call that Celery task and then move on to the, uh, move on to calling the application without waiting for this guy to finish. So the another usage of Celery was we needed some cron jobs. For example, if you are running a MapReduce query, that takes a long time. But we, so we don't want to do those queries when, whenever a user requests for the trends. So we wanted to run it in the background and say, OK, run it every minute and store the results. So whenever a user requests for it, you just have it ready. So even that was easy. So we just defined the uh, ta Celery task as the previous one. And then you, cal you actually run the query, and you define uh, the Celery bit schedule to say, OK, this is the task, and this is the schedule every 60 seconds. That's it. So pretty straightforward. So we haven't covered a very important piece yet. Can anyone guess what that is? OK. Not quite. Test. Uh, sometimes we work the other way around, <laughs> where we develop and then we test, right? Wrong. <laughs> You'll hear more ab ab about that in the TDD in Python talk, uh, uh, Python tutorial tomorrow. But uh, we'll just talk a little bit about test, how it applies to our context. You want to know more about test in Python? Tomorrow, Charles Haynes and Rachel. CD in Python tutorial. What should be very obvious from this pyramid is unit tests are paramount whenever you write your code. Because those say how each block works and how and that it works as it should. Then comes integration tests that are the blocks working together as they should. And then functional from a user's perspective is my system doing what it should. And manual tests, we can't live without them because there's just some things which you have to manually test. But automated test is very important. So let's start with the unit testing. Um, we, we used Django nodes uh, to find our test, uh, create and drop our databases, and to run the test for us. That was already available. And we thought that, that gives us a whole lot of, of, of leverage. But we needed to, we, we, we felt we don't want to hit the database all the time or create objects all the time or, 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 or interact so much with our system because it was slow and a lot of things. So we went for mocking, and I love mocking, mocking like the cup says. So what, what is mocking? It's generally confused for helpers that, that uh, for the testing environment. And... Um, Sometimes to make a unit work, you might need other units and, and environment objects that can help you to make that unit work. So mocks can um, can allow you to create objects of a class which have the behavior instead of that of of, of, of that class without you necessarily hitting the hitting stuff in the class or hitting the DB. So you can you can kind of mimic hitting the DB without necessarily hitting it. But then there's three things which generally people interchange interchangeably think is mocking. So I'll, I'll go through them. First one, mocks, which I've just uh, described. That keeps the behavior and the state. And we want to track how objects are in, in, in our test. Fake objects, which generally have a working implementation of what we want, 
but we do not necessarily want to track the state uh, through, through the test. And stubs, stubs which, um, so stubs just store information and spit it out at us. We don't care what they do after that. They just store and spit out information for us. But mock mocks are the only ones that, that allow you to verify the behavior of an object. So you want to check whether an object I created calls a method. And you want to assert that that method is called on objects. Mocks would give that to you, which the other two wouldn't. Okay. So now le let's look at some functional tests, also known as acceptance test. So the first key thing to remember when you are writing functional tests is they are slow and fragile. But they do give you end-to-end -end scenario testing. So they are important, but you, have, you should have, like, if you have tens of them, then you are in good shape. If you have hundreds of them, then you are in for a maintenance nightmare. So the first problem we faced that we wanted something which will simulate running a server because when you are running a user scenario test, you actually want to run your server, like do some or simulate that user is actually using the application and then see if your application is responding it correctly. So uh, live, live server test case provides you with that, but Django 1.3 doesn't have it. And we couldn't just upgrade to Django 1.4 because we were using non -rail, Django non-rail, which doesn't support the 1.4 yet. They're working on it, but not there yet. So wha what we did was we just patched the live server test case into the Django 1.3. <laughs> and uh, so what is this part? This is our page model. Does anybody know what page model is? Anybody else? Not you. No? OK, so the page model is uh, is a class that encapsulates the selectors and the func actions that can be performed on a particular page. So for example, this login page page model will have uh, the selectors and the actions on login screen. So we are asking the login page to log in as the admin. So this is the login page. People have used Selenium before, right? So this looks similar, so like familiar. Th this is Selenium. All it does is finds an element and then simulates as if the user is typing the username. So you use, like you write these methods and all these methods chain themselves. So, so all these methods return itself saying, okay, so you, you can change them. This login method does, like, okay, go to the login page, set the username, set the password and click login. Right? And then there, there are two options. The login can be successful or the login can be unsuccessful. So this is a pretty basic class. But you can split this login action into two parts, saying login successful and login unsuccessful. And then the login successful returns the matrix page, which is the first page when, uh, that you land on when you log in. Or the login unsuccessful method can return just the login page, because it, it, like you are going to stay on that if the login is unsuccessful. So. If you go back to the usage, you can see that we use the page that is returned by the login page and, uh, and by logging in, and then we call methods on this. So the main thing to remember whenever you are using page model is that the page model should always just do the action. It should never do the assertions. So you should never have the method saying, assert that you can go to latency tab. The page model should always say, okay, go to latency tab. So do what user would do if he has to go to latency tab. And let the test the, the do the assertion saying, assert that you actually, the application actually took you to the latency tab, right? So the another thing, like another uh, advantage of using page model is that you can pull in, pull out all the functionality that is common. So for example, you can see that this matrix page pull, pull, like, is inheriting from the logged in page. So the logged in page will have all the common behavior which all the logged in pages are going to have, like showing the username, logout link, so you do that. So, all, so you don't have to keep like all writing all your tests, say all the tests shouldn't say that, okay, now I have to get the username, do selenium.find.elementbyid, whatever, whatever, right? So is not 
So this is how you pull out the behavior. So did anyone notice um, the functional test fixtures? Has anyone used the fixtures before? Encountered any problems with using them before? Yeah. What so were they? So <laughs> what were your problems? So when we when we when we went the functional test route um, and life se and uh, the selenium uh, route, we encountered such problems. So I'll just talk a bit about the fixtures. Uh, uh, for the rest, for the benefit of others, which are just seed data which you can give to your to your system, right? You, you can load them with fixtures. Now the one thing we noted though was running the fixtures during the test. Uh, you've got uh, the SyncDB that, syn that does the synchronization, it uh, puts in some dummy, some da data into your DB already. And then you try to load your fixtures, uh, which is data, and your DB says, hey, the data you're trying to load, I already have it in, probably with different keys. So there's an integrity error. You're trying to create duplicate entries. Or you try to load fixtures which you've manually created because you type them in and you've as, as assigned a key which probably exists in one system or another system or I mean you're deploying over a multi multiple environment you are not guaranteed that everyone is going to have uh, user na user pin key one everywhere you go so we had to come up with a with a nifty way to so that's uh, your typical fixture so you've got your private key and we use natural keys instead of the content type keys for those who've uh, uh, dealt with content types before because we, we noted that using, natural, using, using the private keys of content types would change from different system to different system. And the only way not to be dependent on, on the primary key, key on the primary key would be to use what is called natural keys in, 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 in the Django world, uh, which is just your, so you use your app name and the model, the app label and the model name. And that becomes your natural key. So to solve our problem of SyncDB, to your, to your, uh, to your uh, uh, concern, so we, we found out that if you, if you run the test, for example, SyncDB runs multiple times and creates the data. So one thing you can do is you can watch out for the SyncDB signal and disconnect where it's creating the, 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 uh, your permission or, perm or whatever data it's creating. And then from there, and then from there, rely on yourself to load the data. The second thing which you could do uh, to override your, your, your primary key issue was have some sort of release task that goes and takes care of that data, which you don't need. It's, it's actually seed data. And replace that data with the right data. That was yeah. So we have everything. So this is our pipeline. This is what our pipeline looks like. So uh, whenever somebody checks in the code, uh, the first step that runs is setup environment, which like if you check in some extensions, new app, new installed applications, that then it will do that. Then it will run the unit and integration tests, which are fast tests. And then it will uh, use the live server test case and uh, run the functional test. And the last part is deploy to production, which, which you can do by pushing a button. And behind the scenes, we run the scripts to deploy to the production. And we also use the supervisor to manage our processes uh, in development. And we've, and we've used it both in development and in prod. It was able to manage, monitor, and restart ser uh, services which we wanted to. So the aim of this project was to empower people at a grassroots level. Uh, with a technologically driven tool to be able to, to combat counterfeit medicine. And this, and, and to also be able to trust the supply, the supply, the distribution chain from the pharmaceutical companies 
we, wanna, we don't want their names to be tarnished because uh, uh, the, 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 the end user has received a product which has killed people and the end user thinks it's the retailer and the retailer thinks no, the distributor might have done, uh, the pharmacist might have done something which the distributor might have done, which the pharmaceutical company might have done. So we wanted that whole chain to be a trustworthy chain. And we saw this as a means to, to make sure that people can both trust the chain and trust the medication which they're getting. And the Pyth Python and the Django framework was very helpful in us achieving what we have achieved. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, questions? Uh, yeah, so we, so whenever uh, the pharmaceutical companies pro uh, generate those codes, like they use our system or they give that those codes to us, we store them in MongoDB. And whenever uh, somebody messages us, we mark, like, or we reply with uh, like good response only once, and then we just mark it use. So if somebody responds with like with the same code again, we just say no. Yeah. I'd just like to know the, the number of users that you've actually have catered for in the system and how it's been scaling. You know? So has it been living up to expectations from a scalability point of view? Mm -hmm. So. So, right now the numbers are prob the system itself uh, is about 100, 100 people interacting with the system. But from a, from the code point of view, we don't know how many people. It's many people. The number of codes which we are probably going to cater for is in the regions of a billion per year. Um, so our systems are are been uh, designed to handle that about a billion per year. Actual users, 100 to 100, 100 to 200 users. Yeah, we're still kind of developing it continuously. Developing it continuously. So. Uh, sorry, I have a question. When people submit the code, do they submit the the product they expect it to be as well, so that you can track what the fakes are? Uh, no, they just send the code. The, the whole so aim, yeah. the, the whole aim was to make it as simple as possible for uh, for for someone in a remote area. Um, you don't want them put in too much information when they submit the code so yeah but if they send the same code repeatedly we can like we have we have that relation between like product yeah. and code so we can track that okay. right. uh, I think you kind of answered it by saying there's only a hundred users so far but even then this is Africa and I was wondering if had there been any surprising exploits like with the mechanism you're using it seems to be vulnerable to a man in the middle attack um, so have you seen that happening yet or has there been anything else that surprised you about how people have tried to get around it? Mm, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> no. well, this actually um, fits in with a man in the middle question. Um, presumably you will have to publish your number that people should SMS very securely. If, it's yes. a, if a bad yes. agent so can get someone to use the wrong number, they can... Yeah. You know. So yeah, so we are, we are going to have like them more like marketing or like reach out to the rural communities and like trust us. Uh, how easy have you found it dealing with the pharmaceuticals themselves? Like getting them to give you the data and work with you and stuff like that. Is Has that been challenging at all or are they like all very on board and stuff like that? Uh, so yeah, we don't directly do it but our client and pedigree like he deals with that stuff. One more question. He can. He can. No. I was just going to respond to that. Uh, the The nice thing is, is that when we when we're doing with, doing with that, uh, we have kind of a, a person in each community that can interact with the the distributors and uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies that starts with the trusted relationship. So actually, we kind of sit in the abstracted away position, which is really nice. Whoever's question that was. Okay. One more question. <laughs> Um, in which countries have you found that there's a high case of um, fake drugs being given out and um, have you managed to detect the source of where this problem is coming from? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. 
Yeah, so really? Ghana, Nigeria, those are the two that come from the top of my head. Um, but also, what we, we what, like we said, what 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 the the aggregation which we're trying to do is to be able to present that these are the drugs that are more commonly fake because now we'll have real data of real people SMS into the system of real people who who, who, are, who are using this this drug. So we'll be able to. Ha- so right now it's more based on this, on studies and things like that. But we would have real data, real people. Right. Thank you, Brian and Sipana. Really <laughs> appreciate you. it. So yeah, if you have more questions, you can just you come can. to the <laughs> talk with <laughs> <store. laughs>